my sins forgot. There is a grave that tried to hide this precious blood that gives
angels who are flying in the midst of heaven and the Bible says that they have the everlasting gospel. This is the same gospel that Matthew has recorded there in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. When people see the number 666, they begin to be afraid. Uh, if somebody uh, last they phone on their last digits in in 666, usually they will run to try to get their numbers changed. Uh, if, if it's in their social security number, they will run and try to get their the, the, the number changed their social security uh, on their social security card. Somebody received a receipt, and when they had received the receipt after paying for something, they saw what the receipt had on it 666, and they wanted to return what they had. So we're gonna we're gonna deal with the number 666 tonight and talk to you about what it's really all about. Come on, say amen. amen. If it's in the word, it deserves to be heard. Now the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 11, that, that we must put on the whole arm of God so that we can stand against the wiles of the devil. And I'm telling you right now, what we're going to discuss, you're going to need the whole arm of God on. Yes, sir. Amen. You're going to need every piece of what, this, what, what God is calling for us to have because we, God's people, are under attack. Yes. Amen. And if the devil can't go upside your head, he's going to go upside your heart. Amen. Yeah, yeah, so he's going to try to touch you in some way. And if he can't get to you, he's going to try to touch your family. And so this is why we got to fortify our minds. we got to make sure that we are centered and covered by the blood of Jesus. we got to make sure that our destinies are sealed. Come on, say amen. amen. We're moving, we're moving, we're moving. On this couple of, uh, this past week, we had talked about that there was war in heaven. And the Bible lets us know that Michael, the archangel, arch and, and Lucifer, uh, who had, had a lot of pride, turned into Satan and they was at war and Satan was cast out and a third of the angels were cast out with him. We understand that the Bible tells us Jesus referenced Satan as one who had fallen out of heaven, who was cast out and he says when I saw him, I saw him fall like lightning. We understand that the problem with so many of us, problem with so many Christians and some of our downfalls is because we get caught hanging around the tree. Come on, say amen. amen. We get caught hanging around the stuff that we need to basically fall back from. Come on, say amen. amen. The Bible lets us know that the serpent said, hath God indeed said to you that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. We understand that it was a Satan who, who tricked Eve, and Eve had bit the fruit, Adam bit the fruit, and for that reason, we have the, we're in the mess that we're in today. Amen. Imagine what the Garden of Eden looked like before sin. Amen. And then imagine what it began to look like after sin. It's a sad day. Just the other day we talked about storms and how uh, there's a storm that's coming and how we need to be prepared. Come on, say amen. amen. And when the storm comes, it's too late then to try to run for cover. We got to make sure that we secure ourselves even now. Come on, say amen. amen. The reason why we need to secure ourselves, because remember now, in the days of Noah, people waited to the last minute before they tried to make the attempt to get on board the ark. The rain began to fall, and it was only then when people began to say, could Noah be right? Okay. Now, Noah was right, and he was preaching it for 120 years. He only had one message, that it is going to rain. My message tonight is that Jesus is going to come. We need to get ready, but there are some things that we must look out for so we'll know that we're on the right track. We'll know that we're on the right track track. We're moving. Revelation chapter 7 verse 1 through 3. A mighty angel has commanded that the final winds of war and destruction uh, not unleash their fury upon the earth and the sea until something very important has been completed. What is it? We understand 
that in the book of Revelation chapter 7, verse 1 through 3, the Bible tells us that there are angels holding back the winds of strife until we, the people in this room, and, and to you, the viewers who are watching, are sealed in their foreheads or have made up in their mind on the issue that they will begin to do the will of God that they will accept his seal, and his seal, according to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 20, is the Sabbath. We found out on yesterday that, that, that God, in God's seal, or his sign, we find in the fourth commandment. There are ten, and in the fourth commandment, we find his name, his title, uh, and his territory. Satan has many names, and the Bible says that he walketh about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Amen. The Bible referenced him as a dragon, the serpent of old, Satan, the accuser of the brethren who steals, kills, and seeks to destroy. Amen. Well, we have been discovering over the last few weeks that there are only two of churches. We, we see a church on every corner. In fact, I passed by at least seven churches around this circumference, around this block, and every church is claiming to be the true church. Every church is claiming to have the truth. Amen. Well, the Bible tells us there are only two churches. That is the true church, and there's a false church. Which one are you in? According to the book of Revelation, chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12, the Bible gives us the description of God's true church. The Bible says, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, and a woman, a woman in Bible prophecy represents God's church. It was clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Now, this is the sun clothed upon her, is that God is, God is shining his glory upon his church in 2017. Praise he is God. shining his glory upon his church in the last days. She had the, the crown of star, 12 uh, of stars on her head, which represents the, the apostles of the New Testament, and the, 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 the moon under her feet, which represents the Old Testament. Praise God. But there's a different kind of woman in the book of Revelation. Amen. In the book Praise of God. Revelation chapter 17, it talks about this other woman. And the Bible says in Revelation 17, and there came one of the seven angels with seven vows and talked with me, saying unto me, come up hither, and I will show thee the judgment of the great poor that sitteth upon many waters. Waters represents peoples in Bible prophecy with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and in the inhabitants of the earth have made them drunk with the wine of her fornication. When it says made them drunk, it's talking about the false doctrines that are being taught in the false church. And many people will rather sit under what makes them feel good rather than hearing the truth of God's word. Praise God. We're going to give the truth here. Come on, say amen. amen. The Bible says that the dragon is wroth with the woman and goes to make war with the remnant of her seed. Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. We understand it gives a description of, in the prophetic of how immediately, as soon as Jesus will be born, that Herod uh, or Rome would seek to try to destroy him. You know the story because we talk about it every Christmas. And how the little toddlers were all killed because they were trying to prevent uh, the newborn king from coming. But God has a remnant and he is coming back for them. God's people identify what should be my motivation for obedience to God's commands. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. But you say it's in the Old Testament. Haven't we heard that before? Yeah. Uh -huh. we're, not, we're, we're not under the law. We're under grace. And that is exactly right. 
because the law demands but grace supplies. Come on, say amen. And so we are we are living witnesses of the extension of God's grace. And that's why we're here tonight. The mark of the beast is the devil's greatest delusion, and it occurs just before Jesus Christ returns. When prophecy-minded Christians contemplate the mark of the beast, they commonly assume it will be some sort of high-tech computerized microchip that will be surgically inserted into human skin by the government. That's what many people believe. Others are convinced that the mark will take the form of a national ID card without which no one can buy or sell. Apocalyptic movies portray masses of people with the number 666 tattoo above their noses. Endless speculation exists with the key word being speculation. There are some people who actually believe that they will receive some type of computerized chip in their forehead or in their hand so that they can be detected by the government. And um, ladies and gentlemen, that is not what the Bible says. And I believe we ought to stick with what the Bible says. Amen. If God said it, I believe it. Yes, sir. Jesus said in Revelation 1 through 3, 1 3, that the reader who hears and understands the words of the prophecies contained in this book are blessed. God has always intended for us to comprehend the book of Revelation, and the mark of the beast is no exception. The truth can be understood and is already known by millions, but the majority have no idea. Well, some of you are probably wondering, what is a beast? Because when I, when I was around 18 years old, when I was around 18 years old, I had, began, I had begun to read the book of Revelation. And in it, it had all type of, of signs and symbols and imagery. And, and it was a scary thought, but I wanted to know what it was all about because it was in the Word of God. Well, I found that in the Bible, in the book of Daniel and Revelation, they, they, it's like a marriage. They, they, they kiss each other. They coincide with one another. And in Daniel chapter 7, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 23, it says, in order to identify the mark, we must first identify the beast, the mark of the beast. So we're going to identify the beast first, and then we'll tell you what the mark is. All right, according to Daniel 7, verse 23, in prophecy, what does a beast represent? Well, the Bible tells us that the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, when you see the word beast in the book of Revelation, it is talking about a nation, kingdom, or a power. Amen? Amen. It's talking about nation, kingdom, or power. When, when Nebuchadnezzar had the dream in Daniel chapter 2, uh, he saw this awful image, and, and it bothered him so much that he was willing to put anybody to death if they could not uh, uh, tell him what it meant, or if they could not recall to him what the dream meant. And this image that we see when in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the head of gold represented Babylon. Yeah. The, the, the breastplate and arms of silver represented the, the Medes and the Persians. And the belly, it represents Greece. The belly and thighs of brass, the legs of iron, and the feet mixed with clay. But then the Bible tells us in, in the book of Daniel chapter 2, that there was a rock that was hewn out of a mountain and it came and smoked the image and dashed it into pieces. We know that to be the kingdom of God. And Jesus and his kingdom is in, in charge. His kingdom is going to reign victorious. You will find that in prophecy that there are all types of symbols and that's why Daniel had these dreams because if he couldn't get it right in Daniel chapter 2, God was going to let him see if he could get it in order in Daniel chapter 7. But these same beasts do, that you see represents the same kingdoms in Daniel chapter 2. This lion with the wings represents, again, Babylon. So you will have intertwining different uh, the sim symbolism, but the beasts are the same. The Bible lets us know that Daniel had a dream after he had prayed. The Bible lets us know in Daniel chapter 
1865 that that Belshazzar had begun to uh, have a party one night and he decided that he would go command that the, that the golden cups and the vessels of gold and silver be pulled from the temple and so that his wives and his concubines could have a good time drinking Moscato and, oh, and, and gin and, and, and some of that other stuff that I can't name right now, like the Mad Dog. I don't know nothing about it anymore. Come on, say amen. But they had that stuff and, uh, and then they had it put it, they had mixed what was holy and, and what was common. And when you do that, expect uh, something to happen. The Bible says that while they were there in that party, that a hand had showed up on the wall and nobody could interpret it but Daniel. And Daniel was given a gold chain. And what I love about Daniel is that he did not turn it down. Come on, say amen. If you got a gold chain tonight you want to give me, I'll take it. I'm going to pawn it and get the money and use it for what I really need. Come on, say amen. In Daniel chapter 3, the Bible says, because Nebuchadnezzar got the big head and believed that his kingdom would reign forever, he decided that he would place in the plains of Dura a, 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 a golden image. And the Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 3 that at a certain sound, when they begin to blow the trumpets and the clarinets, and they begin to play the reggae to, 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 to meet my needs, and they begin to play the hip hop over here to meet somebody else's needs, and they begin to play the country music over here to meet somebody else's needs over there. Whenever this went forth, they were told that they had to come and bow down to this image, and if they didn't, they would be thrown into a fire furnace. Why is it that when we are commanded, when, when it costs our lives, many will find themselves running? The Bible says that we need to have no fear. Mm. Jesus says, be of good cheer because I have already overcome the world. Amen. And I'm wondering why in the world are, is there only three individuals standing up? It means tonight that there are all there, there is only a few people who, 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 who are, will be in the last days who will stand according to God's word and his principles. Amen. We see it through the Bible. We saw it in Noah's day when there was only eight of them on board the ark. We saw it in Lot's day when only he and his family was pulled out. We saw how Jesus had disciples and many was walking with him. But when he said in John chapter 6, if you eat my flesh and, and if you eat my blood, it's the only way uh, you're going to receive eternal life. And the Bible says many have walked away from him that very day. So there's always a small group or a small company who, through the Bible, who have begun to believe and keep the precepts of God. Amen. And we just want to help somebody tonight. Come on, say amen. amen. We are not trying to call anybody out. Listen, we stand here with the word of God and we are presenting Jesus and his love. Amen. Jesus is the only way. Amen. But he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar had his great men throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace. But the one who threw them in went up in flames. They were tied hand and foot and as they were tied in, hand and feet, when Nebuchadnezzar looked in, he said, I said, we did not, we throw three into the fiery furnace, and I'm looking in, and I see a fourth man, and he looks like the son of God. Amen. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Unlocking the mystery number 666. Are y'all ready? Yes. I'm kind of shaking in my boots right now, y'all. <laughs> Holy Spirit, I need you right now. Yes, sir. That's why I'm a to shake it, y'all. I'm nervous. But it's the truth. Yes, sir. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, this nation, kingdom, or power. For it is the number of a man. His number is six, 
6, 6, according to the book of Revelation, chapter 13 and verse 18. Here is wisdom, it says, let him that have, some people have book sense, but they don't have common sense. And he said, if you have understanding tonight, you need to understand, if you count the number of this nation, kingdom, or power, it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Six, six. The letters inscribed in the Pope's attire are these, Vicarious Philidae, which is, a, is Latin for a vicar of the Son of God. Catholics hold that the church, which is a visible society, must have a visible head. Christ before his ascension into heaven appointed St. Peter, this is what they're saying, to act as his representative. Upon the death of Peter, the man who succeeded to the office of Peter as Bishop of Rome was recognized as the head of the church, hence to the Bishop of Rome as the head of the church was given the title Vicar of Christ. This was written back in 1915. So the Catholic Church is saying, we have a man at the head, and they come up with this analogy, is because when Jesus says uh, to, to his disciples, upon this church, I, upon this rock, I will build my church, uh, the, the majority began to believe that Jesus was speaking about Peter. But Jesus was referencing himself. Because Jesus, he is the rock. And unless we fall on the rock, Christ Jesus, and be broken, uh, we will be lost. The Bible tells us that he is the, the chief cornerstone that the builders rejected. The Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter 14, the Bible says, and I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their heads, and I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice and harp of the, of the harps, and it, we jump on down to verse six, and says, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell in the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that hath made heaven and earth, and the sea, and the fountain of waters. Verse 8 says, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen. When the Bible speaks of Babylon, the Bible is referencing a place or mindset of confusion. And God is saying, you need to come out of error. You need to come out of darkness. You need to come out of confusion. And the Bible says that Babylon, she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast, the nation, kingdom, or power, uh, and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, uh, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. His mark, if you receive it, you will receive the seven last plagues of Revelation chapter 16. Well, let's look at, and so, so that we will make sure that we uh, give the right reference to who this beast power is, it's very important that we stick with the scriptures. Come on, say amen. amen. This is not something we're trying to come up off the dome or some analogy. The, it's in the Bible. The beast has eight points of identification according to Revelation 13, 1 through 8 and 18. Let's look at them. It would receive its power, seat, and great authority from the dragon. It will receive its seat and its power from Satan, the dragon. The dragon of Revelation 12, 3, 4, and 9, though primarily representing Satan, also represents pagan Rome 
whom Satan used to try to destroy Jesus when Herod, a Roman ruler, killed the babies of, in Bethlehem in Matthew chapter 2, verse 16 through 18. That's the first identification mark. So the papacy fits point number one. Revelation 13, 1 through 8, and verse 18. In the Bible, we will find in Revelation chapter 12 that there was this beast or uh, this dragon, and it has uh, seven heads, uh, but it had ten horns. We'll find over in Revelation 13 that this horn had a deadly wound. It was healed, but we'll look at that in just a second. We're still dealing with 666. Point number two, it will become a world power according to Revelation chapter 13, verse 3 through 7. None would dispute, none would dispute that during, during the Middle Ages, the papacy was indeed a worldwide power. So once again, the papacy depicts or describes the beast. Point number three, it will rule for 42 months, which will to equals to be 1260 years, according to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 5. Let's move. Remember that in prophecy, one prophetic day equals how many years? One million year, according to Ezekiel 4 and verse 6. The power of the papacy became supreme in Christendom in 538 AD and 1798 when Napoleon's general Bernier took the Pope captive. He died in exile in 538 AD to 1798 AD equals out to be 1260 years. We saw I remember being like in the third or fourth or fifth grade in history and we had began to talk about Napoleon the Great. And what I did not know is that it had this type of significance. Well, we want to see what the Bible says. Let's move, let's move. Point number four, that this, it says the beast who had the number of a man's name will be guilty of speaking great blasphemy against God, according to Revelation chapter 13, verse 5 through 6. And the sad thing about it, church, is the Bible says that all will be wondering after the beast. They will wonder after the beast instead of wondering after the word of God. Jesus, he is the word, according to St. John, chapter 1 and verse 14. Identification number 5 in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, says that this beast would think to change times and laws. Now, many people ran and they flocked to church today because they say that they celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ is something to celebrate. Come on, say amen. amen. But Jesus, through his word, Paul declares, if you want to celebrate, if you want to celebrate what God, what, what Jesus has done, then what you need to do is to be baptized. Yeah, if you want to celebrate the resurrection, or according to the book of Romans, chapter 6, I'm going to the book of Romans, and I'm looking at chapter 6, verse 3 through 5. If you really want to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and the significance behind what he has done, he's saying, uh, be baptized. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 through 5 says, Know ye not that so many of us, uh, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also shall walk in the newness of life. 
For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in, in the likeness of his resurrection. And he's saying, if you want to celebrate, if you really want to celebrate what the Lord had done, you need to be baptized. Amen. It was not about the bunny rabbits. Come on, say amen. amen. It wasn't about the Easter, uh, the Easter egg hunt. Come on, say amen. amen. It is about the salvation of God. Jesus said, if you destroy this temple, then I will raise it up in three days. He said it, and it happened. Okay. Unlocking the mystery number 666, here is wisdom. If you take the Roman numerals and you take vicarious fill it day, if you spell it out, you will come up with the number 666. There is no doubt in my mind that the, in the book of Revelation chapter 13 that when the Bible says that this number uh, it is the number of a man's name, it is referring to the Pope and his uh, position who holds the title Vicarious Philly Day. Identification point number seven, it would be a religious. We're still, we're still talking about the beast. We have not yet talked about what the beast mark is. Uh, it would be a religious power. It is involved in spiritual matters according to Revelation chapter 13, verse 5 and 8. Note, the word worship is about false worship. Again, the papacy fits the identification and identification number eight, it will, it will war with and persecute the saints. Revelation 13, seven through eight. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him all, all the kindreds and tongues and nations and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Of the world. In the individuals who receive the mark of the beast or worship this beast, the Bible says their names are not written in the lamb's book of life. Oh, that bothers me tonight. That, that bothers me. That bothers tonight because we're talking about the mark and when we get to uh, the, 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 the beast but when we get to the mark and identify what it is there are some decisions that will have to be made by the grace of God tonight and I say tonight because tomorrow is not promised what will you do with, with, with what God has given you you can recall when Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit sent him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, according to Matthew chapter 4 and verse 11. Every time Satan says, if you listen, I will give you uh, all this world, I, I will give you all of what's mine if you bow down and worship me. And Jesus defeated him every time with a thus says the Lord when he says, it is great. Yes, sir. When somebody comes to you with some mess, uh, trying to dispute or debate the word of God, don't give them what your opinions are. Go to the word of God and say, it is written. It says right here. And if it's in the word, it deserves to be heard. Come on, say amen. amen. But we have a choice. Satan tried to beat him in the wilderness and he lost. Life and death, it is a matter. The seal of God is the seventh-day Sabbath, yeah. and the, it, it goes versus the mark of the beast. And this is what we have in action. When they look at hieroglyphics and when they look in caves, you will find how even the Egyptians, how they worship different animals. And one of the, uh, the animals uh, that they had worshipped was the serpent. Just today, I was riding down the road, and because we have, uh, we celebrate Easter, uh, we celebrate the resurrection, other various groups decided that today we're going to celebrate as well. So I began to ride down the road, and in some parks, I began to see banners which 
says, we celebrate and we are atheists. We don't believe in God. And when people can choose to do what they want to do, amen. amen. We will have, we are standing right now in what we call the investigative judgment and what we do, what we say, how we uh, care for ourselves and, and how, what we, all these things will determine whether or not we're saved. But the Bible says that what you do is not enough. You cannot work your way into heaven. Come on, say amen. 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 The Bible says grace through faith are ye saved. Amen. We are saved by the grace of God. Amen. We think the change time and law. Well, in order for times and law to be, in order for them to be changed, that means that our constitution, even of the United States, will have to be adjusted. It will have to be tampered with. There will have to be some a removal of some of the amendments and some of the Bill of Rights. Well, we find in Amendment Number One, it says that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peacefully to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. And so in order for, the, for, for a, a law to be um, uh, passed which would have people to worship on a certain day, it means that our rights and our privileges and our constitution will have to be stripped or taken away. And I'm coming to let you know tonight that it is coming our way. Yes, but the question is, how soon is soon? Well, maybe the Bible will, will, will give us some of those uh, old ideas. The very first, there, the very first, there was a law which was enacted in the colony of Virginia in 1610, and it reads as follows. Here it is. Here it is. In 1610, understand then that uh, that that the Africans or the blacks were in, uh, they were slaves. Understand that. Understand that. And it says that every man and woman shall repair in the morning, when it says this, it's speaking of Sunday morning, to the divine service and the sermons preached upon the Sabbath. When they reference the Sabbath here, they're talking about Sunday. And in the afternoon to divine service and catechizing, they're talking about the, the, the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church upon pain for the first fall. In other words, if you didn't show up for worship on Sunday, you got dealt with. Mercy. This is on, this is on the slave plantation, and if you didn't show up in the evening, at, and, and and this and this is the reason why many people who worship today not only showed up in the morning for worship, they show up again in the evening. Yeah. And the reason why they do this is because on the plantations it was demanded, and if you didn't do it, you got whipped. You got whipped. And it says that the first fall to lose was to lose their provision and the allowance of the whole week following. For the second to lose the said allowance and also to be whipped. And for the third offense was to suffer death. This happened in the United States of America in 1610. And what happened then, ladies and gentlemen, is coming again. We gave you the background. Now it's time to give you the breakdown. Are you ready? God's people identified are those in Isaiah 58 verse 1 who will cry aloud and spare not and who will show uh, God's people their sins. No, we are not perfect. Come on, say amen. amen. And like I said the other day, if, 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 if a church was for perfect people, it would be empty. Mm. He says that there are some individuals who are trampling upon my law. Um, he says, listen, attend services, they had to attend services both in the morning and in the afternoon or face the early American version of the three strikes and you're out. Strike one, 
lose your food allowance for a week. Strike two, lose your food allowance for a week and be whipped. Strike three, kiss your life goodbye. And this was not some totalitarian country, some atheistic dictatorship in China or North Korea. This happened here in the United States of America. And in those days, let me tell you something, when you were on the plantation, you could not preach what you wanted to preach. Yeah. And so you had a choice to work in the field to gather up sugar cane or pick cotton, or you could come to church. And if I had my choice, then guess what I was going to be? In I was going to be in church. Yeah. I would have been front and center. Come on, say amen. Yeah, but when you know better, you got to do better. Amen. This worked for them. And it is my belief that God winks at our ignorance. Come on, say amen. amen. And he will not hold us guiltless that which we do not know. But when the light comes in, oh, we got to walk in. Come on, say amen. amen. We got to walk in. We got to walk in. it. As government increasingly, increasingly strips away the rights of its citizens and intrudes into their privacy, and as the religio-political right becomes increasingly aggressive in attempting to legislate personal morality and behavior, the likelihood also increases that at some point mandatory church attendance and on a day incompatible with the belief of many could easily come up for a congressional vote. And this is the reason why you hear much said about global warming and or much said about Earth Day and how one day there will be this agenda to uh, close down the factories, to eliminate pollution, close down the stores, and all those things, so that the people, of, so that the people of God will be in worship. Sounds like a pretty, pretty good idea, don't it? <laughs> Keeping the earth from being polluted, but they will choose then and make it mandatory what day you will worship. And if you're not worshiping on that day, you're going to find yourselves eventually put to death. Now, this is what the Bible tells us. I wish I would have had put this in another color. America once imposed the death penalty for those in violation of compulsory Sunday church attendance. How can a church be of God if it try to make people do something by force? Mercy. If there's a church that is forcing me to do something, I don't want to be a part of that church. Amen. I don't want to be a part of that church. All signs point to the strong possibility that history could be repeated, even here in the land of the so-called uh, the free. There is coming, ladies and gentlemen, a national and global Sunday law. Man. It's coming. We're going to have to slow down a little bit. I want y'all to bear with me. We, we have a few minutes, but we got to get this in because somebody needs this information. Come on, say amen. Amen. Somebody is coming in, into the light of God's word right now. Constantine can rightfully claim the title of great. For he turned the history of the world into a new course and made Christianity, which until then had suffered bloody persecution, the religion of the state. It's found in the Catholic Encyclopedia, volume four, page 297. And we're going to go a lot to the screen because we're going to give you information and we want to give you some research that you can go even to the library, that you can even Google and find out for yourself. Amen. This is the truth, and the truth will set us free. Amen. In the book of Revelation, chapter 11, it talks about uh, the witnesses, uh, witnesses being uh, persecuted over there in the book of, uh, of Revelation, chapter 11. We find the Bible, excuse me, 
talking about witnesses, the two witnesses, but we know those two witnesses not to be literal people. We know them to be the new, of the Old Testament and the New Testament. That one day, uh, that in, in Rome, that, that there are only priests who could have Bibles, or they were only speaking in Latin. And so if you were a common person or ordinary person, you could not own a Bible. Only they could own the Bible, and they will preach traditions rather than the word of God. And because people was coming into the knowledge of the truth, the Bible lets us know that that deed, that the Old and New Testament, according to Revelation chapter 11, were burned. For 1260 years, we know that to be the dark ages. But praise God, we came up out of that. Come on, say amen. amen. And we're here today representing that there are still remaining the people who will be doing the will of God. Here's the problem uh, that we find uh, today where paganism and Christianity has mixed. And God is calling for his people to be separate. And while we're making our way to glory on that path, we are to reach our hand back to help others who are in darkness come along with us to meet the light at the end of the tunnel. That light is Jesus. Yes. Revelation is clear. We worship God because he is our creator. Revelation 14 and 11 and it says that he is our redeemer. Revelation chapter 5 and 9. What has God provided for his people as a sign, seal, or mark of his creating and redeeming power? According to the Bible, his sign or his seal is the Sabbath between us and him. He rested on the seventh day and he was refreshed. Praise God. Where were you yesterday? Praise God. see many people flocking to the churches today in honor of the resurrection. And nothing about the resurrection uh, it gave significance for one to say this, that Sunday, uh, that this would be the day that I will go and worship. Check this out. Notice how, how you have to wait uh, uh, every year around Easter to find out when there will be a vernal equinox dealing with the sun. And, and according to what the sun does, will determine how I'm going to run to church and how I'm going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. But the Bible says that God still remains. And it is a sign between me and it is a sign between you. Amen. I'm trying to help somebody. Amen. Because there are some individuals who will not have peace, real peace, in their life until they get this right. Amen. Won't have real peace until they get this right. I'm just telling the truth, and the truth will set us free. Amen. Amen. The founders of modern Protestant churches knew who the anti-Messiah was. Mussolini and Gasparri signed a uh, historic Roman uh, pact. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 13, you all know about this beast because it had a deadly wound and it was healed. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3. A man claiming to forgive sins. I was talking to one, one lady one day. I remember where I was. I'm not going to call it out. But I was talking to this lady, and she began to talk to me about her priest. And I'm listening, and I'm wondering, well, what is this priest going to do? Because Jesus is my high priest. That's right. Amen. That's right. Yeah, he, he's my high priest. And right now, he is interceding uh, by his blood. And we will stand covered by his blood when, uh, as we are being saved. But there is one who claims the more that he claims to have the ability to forgive sins. Mm. Not only the poor, but there are some priests yes. who claim that they can forgive sins. Have mercy. Jesus. And the very reason why they wanted to kill Jesus is because he had professed that he was a son of God and that he had the power to forgive sins. Have mercy. But at the same time, they're saying that we have the authority to do it. 
but you don't, Jesus. It's kind of messed up. You will find but one created being who can forgive the sinner, who can free him from the chains of hell, the Roman Catholic priest. The priest not only declares that the sinner is forgiven, but he really forgives him. So great is the power of the priest that the judgments of heaven itself are subject to his decision. That is poor, that is straight sheer foolishness. Only Jesus. That's right. God himself has the power to forgive us of our sins. Amen. Amen. Having the power to forgive sins, if we did that, it is worthy of death. Blasphemy. Yes. The Pope has, they say, here's what they say now, the Pope has power to change time, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ, uh, the credible, they translate, episcop, cap. The Converse Catechism, now we're going into a little bit detail. The Converse Catechism says, which is the seventh day? Saturday is the seventh day. This is what they teach even the little kids in their schools, elementary schools. They have to go over the catechism every other day. And what they learn are the, is these things. Well, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Somebody said, we, honor, we, we come to church because Jesus was resurrected on Sunday, on the third day of the week, and that's the reason why we're here. And the Catholic Church is saying, no, 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 no. We change. We have the power and the authority to change the Sabbath from the seventh day of the week to Sunday, the first day of the week. And, ha and had we not uh, had that power, it would not have been done. Oh, Lord. But man can think to do whatever he wants to do. But if God were said something, then we should believe that. Come on, say amen. amen. The Bible says we ought to obey God rather than man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because the Catholic Church transferred some liberty uh, from Saturday to Sunday, they say this is the reason why we go to church on Sunday. And I want to let us know tonight, those of us who are watching and those of us who are listening, this is not an attack on the Catholic Church. God is referencing in the Bible not a church, he is referencing an institution. And he's saying there's an institution that is in confusion and there are some people who are in darkness who need to come out of it and into the light. Amen. That's what he's saying. God has people in every church. Amen. God has people in the Baptist church. Yes. God has people in the Episcopal church. Uh, the, 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 the church of Christ. He has people in the Catholic church. Uh, he has people in the Presbyterian church, yeah. uh, the Pentecostal church, whatever church you find yourself in, he has people in that church. Uh, and guess what? Those people will come out of those churches when they hear his voice, but he's speaking to you right now. Amen. So be it. Amen. <laughs> My Lord. Amen. The authority of the church could therefore not be bound to the authority of the scriptures. They're saying what we believe and our, what our tradition says outweigh what your God has said. We have the power. Look at what we did to Jesus. Oh, have mercy. Have mercy. And you, if you do your research, you will see where there have been some articles where people were saying that, uh, uh, that, that, that the church, the, the, the Roman church institution was saying, you know, we, we need uh, some of the, our churches, the Protestants, we need y'all to come home. We're sorry for what has happened. To, to the, to the, and, and during the Reformation, we, we talked about we talked about Martin Luther and and how he decided that the church should live by faith. The, 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 the Catholic institution is saying, we need all of you, the Protestant churches, we need you all to come home. There are, there is home, there, there, and let, let me just go ahead, and I may, listen, 
There is only one true Protestant church, and that's the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Amen. Amen. Are y'all mighty quiet? Amen. Amen. I'll back it up. Amen. I'll back it up. Amen. I'll back it up from the Word of God. Yes. Yes. Only one true church one. that protests one. that one. there is a man who claims to be God, who sits high, a man who, who, who thought to change time and law, a, a, some authority or some institution who says we have changed the Sabbath from the seventh day of the week, Saturday, to Sunday, the first day of the week, and everybody who worships on Sunday finds itself in line with the Mother Church. Wow. And the Bible lets us know that those who are of the Mother Church are just the daughters of the Mother Church, according to Revelation chapter 17. The church, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath, or seventh day of the week, to the first, made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's day. Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 4, page 153. You want some of this information? Look it up. Go to the library and look it up. It's there. They're not shamed about this information. They're not, they're no, they're no longer burning Bibles anymore. This is who we are, and this is what we believe. And if you don't want to be a part of our institution, if you don't want to be a part of uh, the Roman Catholic Church, they're saying you need to go and join the Seventh-day Adventist Church Amen. because they're the only true Protestants. Amen. 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 We can accept it now or we can accept it later. Amen. You can accept it. You can make the attempt to accept it when the laws change or force you to do it. But at, at that moment, the Bible lets us know it'll be too late. Yes. According to Revelation chapter 16. Can I give you more? Yes. I know you gotta go, but can I give you a little more? Yes. Come on. Yes. All right. Yes. I appreciate yes. that. I, I really appreciate that. Can we talk to you about what some of the churches are saying? Yes, sir. Yes. Let's talk to you. For those of you who are watching, let's talk to you about your church. Let's talk to you about your church. Presbyterians. The Christian Sabbath, they say, the Christian Sabbath Sunday is not in the scripture and was not by the primitive church called the Sabbath, Dwight's Theology, volume 4, page 401. The Congregational Church, there is no command in the scripture requiring us to observe the first day of the week as the Sabbath, father mode, and subject of baptism. Let's look at some of the other churches. Let's look at the Lutheran Church. I have some relatives who are, in, who are Methodist or Baptist or in the Lutheran church. Well, let's look at what your church says. But the problem, here's the problem. Many of us, too many people don't know what they really believe. That's, right. That's the problem. And they're willing to sit down upon anybody's preaching as long as they're hooping and hollering and making them feel good. They'll sit through that and they'll go home and say, oh, we had church today. But then they're We come in and out of church and no real change. But somebody is being set free tonight. Come on, say amen. amen. The Lutheran church, the observance of the Lord's day, Sunday, is founded not on any command of God, but on the authority of the church. Methodist church says this. It is true there is no positive command for infant baptism, nor is there any for keeping holy the first day of the week. This is what they say. No, they don't know. They don't know. Because when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. There were some people who wanted to get on board that ark. But they were worried about everybody else who was living. And that's why some people don't come forth for baptism. Amen. Because they weren't about what everybody else. Oh, yeah, you know, you knew where I was last night. I was at that party. I was at that club. You saw me. You were there. But I'm trying to get my life right. But because how you feel about me, I'm not going to give my life to Jesus? Amen. Yeah, please. Amen. I got to get myself together. Come on, say amen. Amen. 
And if I'm not saved, it's nobody's fault but mine. That's right. You got to stand before God on your own two feet. It's not about them. It's about me and my Savior. And when my name is called, I want to be sure that Jesus is standing by and he says, uh, and look, uh, he looks at me and my garments are filthy and, and, and it says he's guilty. But then the verdict is passed and, and Jesus steps into the room and he says, my blood. My Lord. Episcopalian Church, the festival of Sunday, like all other festivals, was always only a human ordinance, and it was far from the intention of the apostles to establish a divine command and respect, far from them and from the early apostolic church, to transfer the laws of the Sabbath to Sunday, Neander, the history of the Christian religion and church, page 186, translated by Henry John Rose, B.D., Philadelphia, James C. Campbell and Company in 1843. So be it. Dr. Edward T. Hiscox, author of the Baptist Manual. Before a group of ministers made this candid admission, there was and is a commandment to keep holy the Sabbath day, but that Sabbath day was not Sunday. It would be said, however, and with some show of triumph, that the Sabbath was transferred from the seventh to the first day of the week with all its duties, privileges, and sanctions, earnestly desired information on this subject, which I have studied for many years. I ask, where can the record of such a transaction be found? Edward T. Hiscock says, it can't be found in the word of God. But if that's the case, then why are you still there? My God, my God. Praise God. I need to show you something. Give me a second. Give me a second. I know we're doing a lot of reading, but some of y'all need to get this. Amen. Just give me 10 minutes and I'll let you go. Man, all right. Now. Just give me 10 minutes. Right, 10 minutes. I promise you, it'll last a lifetime. Need more. Not in the New Testament. Absolutely not. There is no scriptural evidence of the change of the Sabbath institution from the seventh day to the first day of the week. Of course, he continues, I quite, quite, quite well know that Sunday did not come into use in early Christian history as a religious day, as we learn from the Christian fathers and of sources. But what a pity that it comes branded with the mark of paganism and Christian with the name of the sun god when adopted and sanctioned by the papal apostasy and bequeathed as sacred legis legacy to Protestantism. Wow. The Pope is of so great authority and power that he can modify, explain, or interpret even divine laws. The Pope can modify divine law. His power is not of man, but of God, they say. And he acts as vice generate of God upon earth with most ample power of binding and losing his sheep. Mm. The Pope is no greater than a man than who I am. Nobody. The Bible says, and my brother says, he's nobody. <laughs> you know what? He is a child of God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's right. He is a child of God. Yes, sir. A child of God who has decided that he was going to go his own way. Yes. Cain was a child of God, yes. but Cain decided to go his own way. Yes. Judas Iscariot was a disciple. He was walking with Jesus. He was close to him and near him, but he decided that he was going to go his own way. There are some people tonight who are listening who have decided that no matter what, I'm going to stick to what I know. I'm going to go my own way. Do what you got to do. So be it. Do what you will. Check this out. One of the, uh, I believe it says Caesars of Russia, walked in his park one day, came upon a sentry standing before a patch of weeds. The Caesar asked him what he was doing there. The sentry did not know. All he could say was that he had been ordered to his post of duty by the captain of the guard. The Caesar then sent his aide to ask the captain of the guard. But the captain could only say that the regulation had called for a sentry at that particular spot. His curiosity had been aroused. Let's move. 
Finally, the archives were open, and after a long search, the mystery was solved. The record showed that Catherine the Great had once planted a rose bush in that plot of ground, and a century had been put there to see that no one trampled upon it. The rose bush died, but no one thought to cancel the order. And so for many years, the spot where the rose bush had once been was watched by men who did not know what they were watching. It became a tradition. They really did not know why they were there. They were just there. Many people ran to church today on Sunday out of a tradition that Jesus had rose there. And we celebrate what Jesus has done. When we look behind the grave the cross, there's an empty grave that proves that Jesus is Lord. He is risen. We celebrate that. But it did not change the day of worship. And I was talking to somebody like last week who said, you want to know Sabbath keepers, aren't you? <laughs> y'all believe in this. Y'all believe in that. And I'm saying, well, I believe in what the Bible says. Amen. 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 You trying to tell me about me? Well, you, well you're, tell, you, you, uh, you're telling me about what the Bible says. Well, the Bible says this, and this is what I believe. Yeah. Well, they, got a, they got a man with me. <laughs> <laughs> And when they began to try to tell me about me, about what the Bible says, I said, well, if it's in the Bible, that's, that's what we want, to, we want to keep. That's what we want to do. Law will be changed. People are beginning to meet. The question is, how soon is soon? We see in Revelation chapter 13, in Revelation chapter uh, 13, that those who receive the mark of the beast, uh, in Revelation chapter 13, the Bible says uh, in verse 15, and he had power to give life unto the image. We're talking about Satan. To the beast. That his image of the beast should be both. Should be both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So it's going to come down to the Bible. Do you hear what the Bible says in Revelation 13? That one day, if you ain't worshiping on Sunday, you're going to be killed. I ain't saying this is what the Bible says. Revelation chapter 13, beginning with verse 15. And he called all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. When the government enforces Sunday worship, the government will be enforcing the mark upon people who choose to, identify, to be identified with it. Okay. To be identified with it is to continue doing what you have always done. Verse, verse uh, let's see, 16. And he called all both small and great. We move to verse 17. And that no man, he, here it is, that no man might buy or sell, save he who had the mark. Save the mark. Save he who worshiped on Sunday. Or the name of the beast, or kingdom, or power, or the number of his name, which is 666. So Sunday worship is tied into the number of a man's name, which is 666. This is what the Bible says. And the truth is going to set us free. I know that this is a tough pill to swallow. It's not easy. There are some individuals who are mad right now. There are some individuals who are hurting right now because they've been lied to for all these years. Nobody never told them. Nobody never told me. And I've been worshiping in error all these years. God is saying, Babylon is fallen. Mm -hmm. Confused actions by the private sector to help create more inclusive and humane economy and aid in eradicating poverty and the refugee problem around the world. Sound like some good ideas, amen. Mm -hmm. But there is another agenda. Oh, yeah. Yep. John Wesley. The founder of the Methodist Church says that, that he is an emphatical sense, the man of sin, as he increases all manner of sin above measure. That's what John Wesley said. The Caris Philly Day, we see that it comes up to be the number 666. 
we find in the book of Revelation that there are eight kings of Revelation. It says in Revelation 17, verse 10, five are fallen. One is. One rules only a short time, Pope Benedict. Benedict. And because there are only eight, Pope Francis is number eight. And so my question to us tonight, could Pope Francis be the last pope? You want to know how soon is soon. Jesus is coming. And he's coming very soon. The pope, pope Francis is here. Revelation 17, 10 said that when he comes, he continues a short time. Any day now. And that's why the Bible says you got to work while it is day for the night coming when no man can work. Do you know that we have many religious teachers today standing guard over doctrines and practices, the origin of which they do not know, and they are certainly not rooted in the scriptures? Simply a tradition, they think they are guarding some sacred plank of truth, when in reality they are standing guard over some weed of error. That's what it is, sis. This brings us to our first text today found in Matthew, the 15th chapter, verse 13. Every plant, which here Jesus speaking, every plant which my heavenly Father had not planted shall be rooted up. That is to say, every religious doctrine and practice which is not rooted in the Holy Scriptures will in the end be destroyed. And if you want to stand among the victorious ones in the end of time, then anchor your faith in the doctrines and practices that God himself has planted. Amen. It was John who was there on the Isle of Patmos who understood what Isaiah said to the law and to the testimony. I don't care how they make you feel and how, how they make you jump, but it's how straight you walk when you come down. Uh, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this, there is no light in them. Sunday, Sunday, it is the worship of the sun straight from the horse's mouth to me from the Bible alone that I am bound to keep Sunday holy. There is no such law in the Bible. It is a law of the Holy Catholic Church alone. The Bible says remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Catholic Church says no, by my divine power I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. And that's the real reason why people ran and flocked the church today and don't even know it. Amen. Shops will close down on Sundays. The liquor stores close down on Sundays. <laughs> and, 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 and some people are getting mad and they're trying to find out now how they can get the, the liquor store open on Sundays. I heard this on the radio not too long ago. Shut down. So all these Ten Commandments are of equal importance. Let us be mindful that these Ten Commandments are unchangeable, unalterable. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, we are told that God, He is the Lord. He says, I am the Lord, and I change not. We're going to hear up and get through this thing. We'll let you get out of here. Which is the Sabbath day. We know that it is the Sabbath. Let's see if we can run through this thing. Uh, by what authority will the change that taken place? It was changed by the Roman Catholic. Church. How prove you that the church had power to command feasts and holy days by the very act of changing the Sabbath into Sunday, which Protestants allow of, and therefore they finally contradict themselves by keeping Sunday strictly and breaking most other feast commandments by the same church. This is not my saying. This is what the, uh, the Roman institu institution uh, church is saying. We're going to keep on moving. Because we got to get you out of here. We're going to move. We're going to move. In the catechism of the Council of Trent, the Church of God has taught it well to transfer the celebration and observance of the Sabbath to Sunday. We're going to move. We're going to move. We're going to move. I know, I know we're recording. I know we have some things. But the Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 31, 36 says, And he shall send his angels with a great sound. Now learn a parable of the fig tree when his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves. Ye shall know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye know that the end is near even at 
the door. And because I'm on my way back, and it is at, even at the door, I need you to make some decisions. And I need you to make some tonight. In the Osberg Confession, the Catholics, uh, they allege the Sabbath change into Sunday. Uh, we move on down as it appears. Neither is there any example more boasted of than the changing of the Sabbath day. So they're boasting about what they had done. Yeah. But look at me cross-eyed. And look at me like I'm the one in confusion. Look at me like I've lost my mind. Guess what? I've lost my mind. Jesus. I sure have. I've lost it because Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I let go of my mind so that I can have the mind of Christ. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Amen. God warned that a blasphemous power will seek to change times and laws, and the Catholic Church openly admits doing it, even boasts about it. Let me just let that sit there for two seconds. I'm going to change it. I can't read it off. I'm just doing this for the goodness of God, for the extension of God's grace. Let's move to the next one. One day we will stand before our Lord and our Savior. Yes, sir. Yes, we will. What is it going to be like? Mm -hmm. But of times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. What Paul says, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. Right. But ye, brethren, are not of darkness, that that day should not overtake you as a thief. Ye are children of the light, and the children of day, we are not of the day, nor are we of darkness. God's last warning and message to his people is to fear God and give glory to him. The hour of his judgment has come. Worship him uh, who made us to see the fountain of living waters. The Bible says that you need to come out of confusion. Don't receive the mark of the beast. According to the Bible, Sunday is the mark of the beast. The beast is this power, uh, Rome, papal Rome. It was pagan Rome, now it is papal Rome. God's people lovingly obey. What the disciples say about whether we should obey God or man, we ought to obey God rather than man, according to Acts 5 and 29. Jesus says, uh, in vain do they worship me. Did they run and they flock to the churches today, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. I gotta move. I gotta move. We gotta get to the quiz, y'all. And what we don't cover tonight, we'll just try to cover on tomorrow night. But I believe that what we do, whether we're saved or whether we're lost, is, is, is all, it all happens in the mind. And we'll talk about some of these things on tomorrow night. Come on, say amen. Amen. Send the last place falling on the individuals who are not sealed by the living God. Those who fall uh, by the brightness of God's coming uh, or, or lay refuse above the earth. And for those who lay refuse above the earth, according to Revelation chapter 19, verse 17 through 18, there's going to be a call that's coming forth for the fowls of the air to come eat their flesh. We see in Revelation chapter 17 that there are, listen, there are only two churches. You have the true church of Revelation 12, and you have the false church of Revelation chapter 17. Which one do you fit in? Church. That's my prayer tonight. Amen. That we will remain in the true Amen. church. Amen. Revelation 18, verse 1 through 5 says, Babylon is fallen. Babylon is fallen. Jesus has made a way for us to be saved. I'm going to move. I'm going to move. The seal of God we understand to be the seventh day. And, and we're practically done. I'm just trying to get to the quiz. Kind of get to the quiz. Tomorrow, tomorrow's topic will be America in Bible prophecy. Ah, I just want to just get this in. If a myth is spread long enough, the people will accept it as truth. That's true. Yeah, they'll do that. We got to get through it. We got to get through it. Y'all bear with me. But isn't God good? We're going to get through this stuff. We're going to get through it. There are a lot of things. You know what? 
I'm gonna try my best to get through to this quiz. <laughs> but isn't God good? Amen. It is, isn't his word sure? His word converts the soul. Some of these things are coming our way. The Bible tells us that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And all we had to do was believe and to be to be broken Say. free. We come to the quiz tonight. We're done. And all we had to do was believe. Amen. I pray that you have your